Welcome to the fifth episode in our Character Evolution Cast series, everyone. Amelia is feeling under the weather, so it's just me during this cold open. But don't worry, because she was with me when we welcomed Amanda and Grayson to this special episode. Before we get to that, let's get our normal announcements out of the way. According to my calendar, International Podcast Month is drawing to a close very soon. We're actually in the last week's stretch if you're listening to this episode on release day. I've been trying my best to keep up, and every single episode has been an absolutely amazing joy listening to all of these podcasters collaborating together. Head on over to the I Am Here, that's H-E-A-R, podcast feed to get all this delicious audio goodness in your ears. Or head on over to internationalpodcastmonth.com and check out everything from episodes to blog posts to podcast reviews. If you check out our show notes, we'll have direct links to the episodes that I myself was involved with. And I believe there is one more to be released, a D&D 5th edition one-shot run by the One-Shot Network's very own Victoria from the Broadswords. Speaking of, if you wish to support the show, there are many ways to do so. You can head on over to the OneShot Patreon page and get access to some great bonus content for as little as $5 per month. That's at patreon.com slash oneshotpodcast. Also, you can leave us a review either on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or our Facebook page, and we'll read it out on the air right here during our opener. And speaking of, we have officially run out of reviews. Since Amelia isn't here, we'll refrain from reading one of our Facebook reviews from those who've already left us Apple Podcast reviews. Sorry, Kyle. But we'll have links in our show notes to our iTunes page and our Stitcher page. So please follow whichever is most convenient for you and let us know what you think of our show. So next week, when Amelia is back for the opener, we can read one of your shiny new reviews and get some nice warm fuzzies at the same time. Well, with all of that out of the way, let's get on with the show. Enjoy. cast, a show where we discuss what to do with all those characters we just made. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and today my co-host Ryan and I are joined by players from two actual play, or AP, podcasts, Grayson of Heroes Not Included, and Amanda of Join the Party. Folks, welcome to Character Evolution Cast. Thank you so much for joining us. Grayson, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and some of the cool stuff that you're involved in? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I am Grayson, and I am a player on Heroes Not Included, which is a podcast that I produce with my partner, who is the DM. I do a lot of the audio stuff, as well as the social media. And the character I play is Aspen Tamble. He is a gnome, and he is very excited about everything all the time. Other people might also know me from my work that I do around the Transgender Language Primer. It's linked on the RPG cast site for people who are in the community looking for us. Um, and we're basically a glossary of words and language around trans and gender experience. So I have a wide breadth. <laughs> it's a very helpful resource. I've used it a couple of times now just in like general conversations with friends. I love it so much. Thank you. I love it too. <laughs> <laughs> and Amanda, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and some of your projects? Yeah, my name is Amanda McLaughlin. I am a player and co-producer on Join the Party. We're a 5e actual play podcast that sounds like a, an audio drama. And we have <laughs> composition and scoring, sound designing, and try to make it sound really, really good. It's also tailored for new players, as well as those with a lot of experience in role-playing games. So we have a beginner's version of our first couple episodes with tool tips for people who haven't played RPGs before, as well as an after party, a talkback show after every single bi-weekly episode 
episode that we publish where we answer people's questions, talk about the experience of making the show, give advice to people who want to uh, play more or make shows themselves. So that's been really exciting. We started in um, June of 2017. So as of this recording, a year and a couple of months old. But I've been making podcasts for about three years. And now, as of uh, this month, my full-time job is running Multitude, which is a podcast collective and Ooh. consulting company that I started and that joined the party is under. Oh, and my character is a rogue, a rogue assassin called Inara Harthorn. She is a lesbian skater flip teen who loves stabbing, but not really murder. And uh, she falls in love with any older woman who crosses her path. So it is uh, it is very fun as a queer person to play a queer person on uh, my podcast. That is awesome. Now I'm even more excited. I want to get to it sooner now. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> That's the trick is just make your podcast as queer as possible and people will check them out. Exactly. That's, yeah, we're, we're trying. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, one of our goals on Character Creation Cast, aside from making amazing people, is to introduce our audience to people who are doing awesome things in the RPG world and the real world, too. We would be remiss if we didn't do that here as well. So let's get started getting to know you two a little bit better. Let's see. I'll just throw the question out there and see who wants to answer first. Do you have a favorite RPG podcast, AP or otherwise? that you think folks should know about and why do you like it uh, i think all podcasters have favorite podcasts and the problem is is that we have to pick one when it comes to this question i actually have two that i would recommend to anybody who is listening and particularly anybody who also ends up liking my show the podcast that got me into actual plays is fandable and particularly mm -hmm. any of the stuff that angela runs hearing her dm her group which is a bunch of dudes that I consider pretty similar to the group that I run with, gave me the confidence to start running my own game on Sundays. Um, and I feel like her group in particular, even when they aren't involved in the lore of their particular character, they have enough say in the world that they get really invested. And I think that's a really big part of character creation that we talk about, but like the actual investment, I don't think a lot of people understand that like, you can't just put two chips in. Like, you got to go all in on your characters. Mm -hmm. And the other one that I think uh, people should listen to that hasn't been around as long as Fandible, so probably doesn't have as many listeners, is the Magic Folk podcast, um, mm -hmm. which I consider to be kind of a cousin to the Heroes Not Included podcast. I've been a fan of theirs since launch, and in that case, the players I know are directly involved in creating the lore around some of their characters and even some of their species. And I feel like it really shows in their podcast, in their actual play. And what about you? I am sure I'm not the first person to say so, but The Adventure Zone was really my first exposure to role-playing games. One of my siblings has played RPGs and DM'd since uh, we were like 11 and 12, but I completely missed it and was too busy <laughs> in theater club in high school to notice what he was doing down in the basement twice a week for a decade. But The Adventure Zone was really story-driven um, in a way that I really needed as, as a hook for me to get interested and then got interested in, in playing my own games IRL. So that continues to be a real favorite of mine um, and one of my must-listens when it comes out every week. It's one of like three podcasts with notifications on my phone. I also really <laughs> love Bombarded. I, I just marvel at the amount of work that those folks put into every episode so those are two of my faves dames and dragons is amazing venture maidens there's just so many people doing incredible work out there so it's a good time i think to be a role-playing nerd in mm -hmm. the podcast space oh, absolutely the the ap movement just won the diana jones award too at gen con for their ability to get new people into the hobby too and i think i know that's not how i started but it definitely is a thing that brought me back into it after a long time away so mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of value in those kinds of shows for people do either of you have an absolute favorite moment from a game that you've played i know that that's like a really hard question to answer but <laughs> i can take this one first since i i pawned the other one off but my favorite moment happened in the second arc of Join the Party. So a little bit of context, I had only ever played like two games of D&D &D individual sessions before I started a role playing podcast. Um, <laughs> so it's not something I necessarily recommend to everybody. But in our like pre production and development of Join the Party, it was really 
it's important to me that everything we did was completely understandable and accessible to beginners. And it was useful that I was a complete beginner. So if I had questions, I knew other people would as well. So that being said, the the moment that comes to mind for me is the first time that I lied in character to another member of my party, where my character did something that I knew that the other character would not stand for. So myself and then our third other player. So, you know, me and one of the characters were complicit in covering up the thing that I did and did not let the other other character know. So, of course, sitting at the table, the player knows and it's not a personal attack, you know, not not a personal <laughs> betrayal whatsoever. But some part of me really felt like I was lying to my friend. And that was only, you know, a few months into into playing our campaign. So it was just so amazing to me how really powerful and uh, like rooted in reality that decision felt, which I think is, is a testament to my fellow players and also to our DM for setting up a story where consequences so clearly mattered. We've had a lot of talk on our show about our feelings about inner party conflict. <laughs> Ryan is not for it, and I am all about it. <laughs> it's completely justified in the story, but yes. uh, yeah, I sometimes I'm not gonna... it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Agreed. I'm not saying no inner party conflict. Maybe a little bit, but I know Amelia likes to go all in on that sort of conflict, and you know that's fine too. I think two of our last three sessions have ended with my character getting like punched in the face. So <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Good. What about you, Grayson? I have a lot of favorite moments because I've been playing with this group for a long time. We've been playing together for almost four years, almost weekly. Wow. So we have a long storied history together. <laughs> but I think one of my favorite moments is in our, I think it's in our, third season maybe our fourth there's a scene where we are being sent by a patron to somewhere else to deliver a letter and we get ambushed basically in the what we describe as the magical elevator it's like a portal to another dimension and it ends up being like this kind of glass elevator situation and aspen has been in the podcast since the beginning but the boys uh, switched out their characters halfway through our run so far. And so they were new to Aspen, and they're both kind of like gruff and tumble dwarves. And so they don't really take Aspen super seriously. And <laughs> in this fight, Aspen comes out, and the first move that I was able to do, I rolled a critical success with my brand new Vorpal Sword. Nice. And decapitated the, <laughs> the, the bad boss lady in the elevator with us and it like at the table took the boys aback that I had done this. And I think it was the first time them both at the table as their characters and as like the characters themselves really took Aspen seriously for the first time. And was like, Oh, he's actually like should be out here in the plains with us. And you know, isn't just some material goober. <laughs> <laughs> I love moments like that okay. where it just matches up with what you really want it to be. And you like roll really well and it's perfect. <laughs> so good. It's such a good feeling. Mm -hmm. All right. So then is there a game that you haven't gotten into play yet that you really want to try? This is another one of those questions that I feel like everyone who plays role-playing games has to answer yes. I'd be skeptical <laughs> of anyone who answered no, unless they had like a very intense con season. Because my <laughs> shelves are full of games that I haven't gotten to play yet for a variety of reasons. I think the one that I really want to play right now is Dungeon Commander DC's uh, Mutants in the Night, which is uh, Blades in the Dark hack. You took my answer. No. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, well, we found half of a play group. So. It's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's the one that I'm kind of like most jonesing to get into right now. There are a couple of others on my shelf that are up there and are like in order to like be played soon because we play through additional systems in our patron cast through our Patreon. But uh, I think that's the one that I'm most itching to, to get to. 
Well, I concur. I think Blades in the Dark <laughs> is awesome. I had not heard of that uh, hack or, or reskin, but I've been wanting to play Blades in the Dark for a long time. That's the kind of novels that I loved to read as a teenager is sort of like crime in the city, whether that's like, you know, urban fantasy or, or other. So instead, I will say that I have been playing a lot, a lot of uh, Monster Hearts, and it is so fun and so pure. And I have to travel by train like two and a half hours to get to my Monster Heart play group. Cool. But um, uh, it is completely <laughs> worth it because it is really fun and also really collaborative. I'm I'm lucky to have a really like lovely and uh, collaborative environment in my you know main campaign on Join the Party. But Monster Hearts seems oriented to like create conflict and create story together, mm -hmm. which I understand is not always the case in everybody's groups. So it's just like a, a lovely, lighthearted, you know, wonderful afternoon kind of game. That's awesome. So what is your favorite part of being on an actual play podcast? For me, it's inspiring other people to play. I don't get to uh, carry the mantle of like having loved D&D for 10 years and just want everybody else to enjoy it as well. But I have loved it intensely for a short period of time. And so creating resources for other people to learn to play, hearing people say like, I never thought this was for me, but actually it's now my favorite. Or, you know, I'm going to go to my local game store for the first time to try to meet other people, even though it terrifies me because I think it's worth it. That that sort of message always really, really inspires me. Uh, I also hate conflict as a writer. I always have trouble <laughs> making my characters suffer because I love them so much. <laughs> so uh, for me, it's just a, a good exercise to show up every day trying not just to like save my own skin but to make interesting stuff happen for our audience so the sort of like you know fifth person in the room that is the audience is really really useful to me as i become you know a, a more seasoned player i think for me one of the the reasons that i got into actual play podcasting is i enjoyed them intensely for one and they allowed me to play a bunch of systems that i couldn't do before because i just didn't have time but I got into it because I had a lot of friends who couldn't get together a game group to work for them. You know, they couldn't find people online. You know, coming from the trans community, there's a lot of transphobia out there. And especially in the gaming community, unfortunately, we have a lot of toxic people just hanging out. Um, and it's really hard to kind of find a space to meet people to play a game where you kind of don't have to vet everyone you get in contact with. So for me, being able to put my games that I have at the table into a format that my friends can listen to, my community can listen to, and kind of get a little bit of that experience in their lives, even if they can't go out and actually find a physical group. Um, and that's one of the things that I've really felt in our reviews is a lot of people talk about how they feel like they're at the table with us. And that's kind of like what I was going for with our podcast was to make people feel like they could be at the table with us, you know, that they have a group, you know, they might not have like a super active role in it, but, you know, they can be as active as they want to within the confines that we have. And, you know, if that brings a little bit of, of joy to them and, and their ability to play the game, that's great. I think for me, especially actual plays were... They were so different from the games that I was playing at my home table. I was playing at, for a, a long time with my ex-husband's group, um, and they were not the most, like, understanding and welcoming folks. And so, like, listening to actual plays and even just – I think that the RPG podcasting community has been really welcoming and open and, like, positive in ways that – the rest of the gaming community hasn't necessarily been. And so that's been a really huge for me to see that happening around me. And then also now eventually to get to be a part of it feels really good. And I want everybody to have that kind of experience at the table that I've had with the group that I play with for a podcast. Yeah. It, I, I wish I could be part of the AP podcast movement as well but I am thoroughly enjoying listening to everybody out there doing this because it, for me as a, a father of two small little kids, I, I don't get much time to get together with my friends anymore. <laughs> so re yep. really my role playing experience is this podcast and listening to APs right now. And, you know, it fills that gap for uh, us busy adults that, wouldn't be filled otherwise. So uh, I thank you all for for doing what you do to help people like me as well. 
Yeah, that's where I was at for a long time because mm-hmm. like I didn't don't think I got back into gaming until my youngest was like three. Yeah. It was just like there's no time. There is no time. <laughs> leaving the house is hard. <laughs> And now I just don't leave the house. I just play from home. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it's at. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Well, now that we know a little bit more about you, uh, we are going to get into the really fun stuff. Our goal with these episodes is to help people become the best players possible at the table. In our regular show, we cover how to make great characters. Now we want to cover how to play them. So... In today's episode, we are going to talk about concepts that players can take from actual play podcasts and incorporate into their home games. Like I said before, more and more people are getting their introduction to RPGs through podcasts and Twitch streams and things like that. And so while that's a really, really good start, I think that there's a lot more that people can learn than just the rules of the game. And so we want to talk about how people can take some of those concepts and bring them to their own table. Yeah. So what do you think are the biggest things that people should listen for as they enjoy actual plays? I think, honestly, when I listen to other actual plays, what I listen for is players who are just like intensely enthusiastic about their characters, because I feel like that is the number one thing that you can bring to the table as a player that will make your game better is enthusiastic Mm -hmm. excitement about your character and the story that you're telling. Like I said before, that investment is just super duper key because we're not all performers. You know, we don't all have high charisma scores, but, you know, (laughs) you can play somebody who has a high charisma score at the table even without it. Um, You just got to get enthusiastic about it. So I always listen to people who have characters that they can kind of get into the grit of, and they're constantly kind of like giving you more information about. I really appreciate the sort of collaborative nature of most actual play podcasts. It is awful to have conflict with or not to hear heard by people IRL, and it's much worse to hear other people experience that in a microphone or in your headphones. So something that we talk about a lot before every session and before we started our show was being really generous and always saying yes and you know that's that's such such like a cliche thing (laughs) to hear but when I first heard of that in like high school improv classes I was like holy crap this is a great model for life so having this spirit of not saying that's a dumb idea I don't want to do that why would we blah 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 my reaction is always to say like sounds great how can I add to something that someone else wants to do. Obviously, when you get into character motivation and conflict and all of that, that's also an important part of the equation. But I think if your first impulse is to, you know, accept on and want to build off of what your colleagues and your players want to do, that's that's a, a really kind of great place. Similarly, I love to text our DM with like hooks and items and people and conflicts that I really enjoy in other actual play podcasts just to he's always asking us for ideas and what we want to do what we want to accomplish and so when I say to him like I love that this tavern has like a portal to a different reality I I don't know I just I love the idea that I can just kind of throw a bunch of stuff at him and he will bring into our campaign you know some of those things that um, he knows will make us uh, grin and really get excited. (laughs) Yeah, I think that goes along with the enthusiasm, too, is that not only having enthusiasm for your own characters, but having enthusiasm for the ideas of the other people at your table is really important. You are not playing this game by yourself, and you are not playing this game, in most cases, with just you and your GM. There's a whole group of people around the table, and so being excited about the things that they're doing, too, is really important. Mm -hmm. And I really like hearing... Uh, when people out of character on EP podcasts feel like they're good friends with each other. Like, even if there's conflict yeah. at the table with uh, with character-to-character conflict, when you know that the people that are doing this are actually really good friends, maybe even real-life good friends, that brings a level of enjoyment that if you know that there's some actual, eh, these people might not like each other, why are they even doing this? Uh, that might uh, detract a bit from uh, some AP stuff. And it makes conflict more meaningful. It makes those moments where you have to say, like, listen, I'm really sorry, but my character is not going to do this mean a lot more and be a lot weightier mm-hmm. and, and advance your story in a, a much more serious yeah. way. 
And I think that comes through to a listener in a show when you're like, I know that this was a really hard decision for you, both in character and out of character. So if people are trying to emulate these things that they hear in actual plays, uh, it can be kind of daunting and I think sometimes disappointing because a lot of the shows, like we said, have people who are trained performers or have been doing it for a really long time or in a lot of cases are pretty heavily edited. So what are things that we can do as players to kind of manage our expectations when you try to bring those things to your table? What can you do to be okay with the fact that yours is not going to sound like a fully edited podcast? So something that you do not hear in in our actual play podcast are all the moments that we need to have a bathroom break, uh, <laughs> the moments where I need to refill my water when something is going in a direction and I have to say, like, guys, like, I, I don't know about this and really just ask other players questions before I just plow ahead and do something in character. So uh, rules that we have on our kind of non on microphone game sessions are that like you can take bio breaks whenever you want it's not rude to leave the table if you have to go to the bathroom refill your water you know go text someone deal with a kid or a cat that is absolutely expected and fair and other people will pause if they need to have you around and it might sound basic but to me it's just really i'm really um comforted knowing that I won't have to like stop everyone else's flow if I have to just do something for a few moments. And similarly, we have the role of the X card where there's a index card on the table with an X drawn on it. And if for any reason you're uncomfortable, you want to move on, a joke doesn't sit well with you, you want to fade to black in whatever the scene is, you tap it, no questions asked, and the GM or DM moves us along. So both of those, I think, are, are really great ways to kind of make people at the table feel a little bit less bad about having the, I don't know, clunkiness or not having that like completely seamless feeling momentum mm -hmm. that your favorite AP podcasts may have. Totally. A hundred percent. And I would like to echo the, uh, you don't hear all the meta talk on the podcast. I go to extreme yeah. lengths to make sure that I keep our meta talk pretty short. <laughs> I also cut yeah. our goofs a little short. So we also tend to be a little clippier than we are at the table. I, I think just like being aware that reality is not an actual play podcast and that um, your favorite streams do a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that it flows smoothly when you actually get to the stream itself. I feel like streams are a little bit better because like you can't edit out people's ums in stream, which mm -hmm. I know all of us edit all of those things out because we sound... <laughs> 100% of the we time. Sound you must. You must. Our audience is going to have no idea what you're talking about because we edited out that um. It's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> and four hours of play need to be 45 minutes of tape, you know, in, in our case. So it, it must it must be edited if that's the style of podcast you're going for. But I mean, I, I completely agree with that. I know for one of our recent episodes that we put out for Shadow of the Cabal, we did leave in one kind of out of character check-in moment, which normally all of that kind of stuff gets cut out because it we edit it for narrative flow. But in this case, it was sort of a character conflict moment. And we left in this moment where another player said to me, hey, stop, pause. Are you okay with this? And of course, my answer was like, yes, let's do this. This is amazing. But it was really important that we had that kind of moment. And so those are the kinds of things that are like the discussions that are happening behind the scenes. And if I had said no, we would have gone back and kind of adjusted that accordingly and you never would have known the difference so don't feel bad if your game doesn't flow that way because we again like Grayson said take great pains for it to not sound like that and so your game is going to feel a little bit clunkier and don't worry about it because ours are also really clunky <laughs> like what comes out to be nine episodes is only three sessions. So like we're not playing in one hour fast paced snippets. We are playing longer sessions and cutting stuff out and making it sound nice for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, one of the things that people might notice is that there's a significant portion of time where people are spent talking in character on these shows. And now I know a lot of that has to do with we're editing out a lot of the meta talk, but do we have any advice for ways that players can try to maintain that level of uh, immersion 
or any thoughts on how that is helpful to the experience? So I am a big fan of in-character talking. I'm probably one of the people at the table that does it more than the others on the podcast. And I feel like for me, it's all about keeping your headspace and keeping your own internal immersion into what your character is going to do, should be doing, wants to do. And for me and Aspen, I usually use a voice because I find it easier. And one of the things about being on a podcast for me as a trans person is I deal with a pretty significant voice dysphoria. So Aspen was kind of my way of working that out by using a voice that is more specifically like my my head voice, like the front of my mouth voice. And I know that some people are intimidated by voices, and I totally 100% get that. I am not normally a voice person. When I DM, I don't do a lot of voices. And for those people, I would recommend, like, and it sounds kind of silly, especially if you're, like, doing it online, but I recommend, like, really light cosplay just to get yourself into the headspace of your character. Mm. When I'm having a bad day and I feel like, you know, I'm just not really into it today, like I don't feel like playing, like something happened and I'm off, I always pick an outfit that's going to make me feel a little bit more like my character. So for my (laughs) Sunday night group, when I was a player, I was a dragonborn champion. And so when I was having one of those days, I would pull on my biggest clunkiest boots and stomp over to the table in those. (laughs) And before Aspen, I played a bard named Mercurio. And whenever I was feeling a bad day with him, I would put on like my most flamboyant button-down shirt to wear to the table, just to give me that little bit of flair that I needed to be Mark for that day. But I think those little, little touches, like you don't have to feel silly about it if you feel embarrassed about that kind of thing. It could be something really simple that just gets you into that space. I love the suggestion so much one of my best friends gifted me a headband that made her think of my character Inara just after we started joining the party. And it was like maybe the most touching gift I've ever received <laughs> because it, it was so meaningful and remains so meaningful to me and helpful as a new player to kind of develop these skills of slipping into character. Using a voice is also really important for me. And I actually asked my fellow players for help when we were first starting out in in helping me develop that instinct. I was also very shy about it. I, you know, it, it made me nervous. So So starting to kind of develop that in games that don't require role-playing, like we're a huge fan of Betrayal at House on the Mm -hmm. Hill. In my household, we play it like once a week, and that's a a board game, basically. But there is opportunity to kind of insert some role-playing elements if you want. So even just like putting on an evil witch voice if you play the evil witch or something like that, help me kind of start to do that in small ways. But returning to developing a a voice in our D&D campaign, our GM will often ask me questions, you know, I'll say something like, oh, well, Inara is going to jump up onto that roof and and try to get into the window. He'll say like, okay, well, what does it look like? Or um, what are you thinking? Or, okay, so what do you say to the tavern owner? And these questions put me on the spot in a small amount, but I, I asked for that. And I asked for those opportunities to not just describe an action, but to play it out. So that's been very helpful for me. And you can hear over the podcast as I move from saying things like, Inara does this blah, 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 to just saying it and just doing it. So having players speak to me in, in their own character voice and our GM to give me uh, kind of gentle prompts have been really helpful. So I have two things that I want to say about this. <laughs> the first is we, for people who haven't listened to it, we do have an episode on character voices. It's our first character evolution cast episode that we did with James D'Amato. And he gives a lot of really good advice about even things like just adjusting your face and your posture Mm -hmm. and, you know, the amount of energy in your voice are all really easy things. I think in one of our recent episodes too, Caleb from Sounds Like Crows was talking about just like, go practice a voice in the mirror. He's like, go try and do an impression and it's going to be a bad impression, but then now you have a whole new character and that's fine. (laughs) The other thing I will say is that while I was at Gen Con, I attended a panel called Acting for Roleplaying which was run by Ali Grauer and Drew Merzieski from the Welcome to Warda podcast. But Drew talked about using three different kinds of voices when you are playing. The first one being your out-of-character voice, which is just your regular voice, who you are, whatever, when you're talking about rules or like, hey, I need a quick bathroom break. You have your voice where you're paraphrasing things, where, like Amanda's talking about, where you're explaining what your character is doing. I jump up on this ledge. I go talk to this person. Where you are talking about your character, but not in character. And then the third one is your in-character voice, which is you 
embodying that person and speaking with their voice. Mm -hmm. And so I think just keeping in mind which one of those you are using and trying to make sure that you're using the right one for the situation. And ideally, you'll work up to that third one where you are speaking in character and describing things as if you were that character. But it takes some practice. You'll get there. (laughs) Something I've noticed from my own experience in doing AP podcasting is the importance of keeping focused on the game and paying attention even when it isn't your turn. I'm using air quotes and people can't see it. So how do you think players can make sure that they are sharing the spotlight and keeping up with what's happening in the game, even when it's not specifically their time to do something? We have a no phones rule at our table, which I think is helpful. It is very tempting to just open your phone if it's there in your hand. So we plug our phones in and leave them in a different room. And if someone's phone rings a bunch, my our, our recording studio roommate uh, will come and tell us if there's an emergency. But that is really important for us just to kind of encourage and like set us up for success in terms of paying attention to our our other players. I'm also just really interested in these other characters. I'm interested in what they do. We've talked a lot about their motivations, their backstories. I don't know a lot about these characters that my character doesn't know. You know, like there's not a lot of knowledge gap between what we've said to each other in the game and what we what we know as players. So I want to hear information be revealed. I want to know what these characters are saying and doing and thinking. So so that that has worked for me as well. And then if I ever have an impulse to, you know, um, kind of add something in or a question I want to ask, follow up, I take a lot of notes as we play, both because I forget uh, if there's two weeks in between <laughs> sessions yeah. and because it's helpful if my, you know, mind is whirling or my hands are fidgeting just to have a, an ability to, you know, doodle or to write something down or, you know, not forget a question I want to ask later has been my kind of best strategies. Yeah, to to piggyback onto that, you know, I would like to encourage note taking. I am a terrible note taker. Um, so it would be <laughs> kind of hypocritical. But I feel like when you are a person who takes notes, you are much more likely to be invested in what is actually going on. So I do my best to try and take notes. I think the thing that keeps me there is I'm just like we've been saying this whole time, I'm just genuinely a fan of the other characters at the table, you know, even if like sometimes I disagree with them and sometimes they rub me the wrong way and sometimes they do things I vehemently disagree with. But at the same time, like I'm still super fans of them and I still want to see what's going on with their story and I want to see where their terrible decisions lead because they're probably going to drag me along. (laughs) So I I think being, again, that, that investment in the table and I think the no phones role is like so necessary and it's so hard because it's kind of ubiquitous, but I feel like it's just so important because I know that there have been times where we've been at the table and somebody is taking notes, air quotes, their iPad or whatever, and they are not checking, they are not taking notes, they are checking Twitter or <laughs> Facebook or something. And you can tell, you can hear it. And I, I feel like, you know, there have been other APs that I've listened to where I'm like, oh, so-and-so has had a day because they are not here tonight. Like, they are just not invested in this game today. And I feel like we all have those days. I feel like on actual plays, we have to try and minimize as that's happening more. So that's why it feels like yes, there's less of an issue because we have to because we're making a podcast. Yeah. Yeah, there's this moment where you're like, okay, I have to be on now. I, like, bring the charisma, turn on the spotlights, whatever it is. But there are days where I do not feel it. Like, work is rough or whatever. And you're like, okay, now just turn it on. (laughs) You know, and scheduling is always the, the eternal albatross of the podcasting community. So I feel like... I feel like of the gaming community in general, man, it's true. like adulting is hard. Yeah, it's uh, 9 p.m. on a Wednesday or 10 a.m. on a Saturday and nothing in between. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you've got, you know, like these times between recordings and then like you have this one weekend this month that you can record and you're like running out of backlog. And so now you have to be on even if you had like the worst day imaginable. So there's a lot, I feel mm-hmm. like there's a lot more pressure on the the being able to perform on cue in that way. Yeah, I think that that kind of forces you to like keep it together then too, though, because you know that you don't have time to mess around. So you are like, okay, we're going to pay attention. We're going to do this. We're going to like have a good session so that we can get something out of this. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and things like light cosplay, um, which I am going to completely steal that phrase. I am totally enamored by it. Or like having, I always make sure to have the best breakfast ever before we go to a session, both so that I am like physically all ready to go and ready to, you know, talk and pay attention for several hours, but also just to put myself in a, in a good mood and, and try my best to bring my best self to recording. That being said, there have been lots of times where I've asked our, you know, our colleagues like, hey, guys, uh, you know, I had a bad day. If I'm uh, a little reserved, it's it's not you, it's me. And just try to be as honest as I feel comfortable being and, and really asking for their assistance. And, you know, I'm I'm really happy to be making the show with people who weren't my friends to begin with, but are now very, very good friends. So I hope everybody kind of has that level of honesty and, and collaborativeness at their table. To kind of piggyback onto that and to bring around something that we talked about earlier, I would also like to be a strong proponent for taking breaks I'm a big fan yeah. of the scheduled breaks. We take them like once an hour when we record. And mm -hmm. sometimes your attention span is just waning because your blood sugar is low, my friend. Go grab a yeah, Snickers. Me too. Mm -hmm. But don't eat it on the mic. That's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> eat it on That's why we mic, take breaks. And then lick the mic and eat the pop filter. <laughs> just, we're like very close now. Just going to make out with this microphone. Yeah. <laughs> I will say one thing that I've noticed is and I'm really bad at it today, apparently. But when we're recording, you cannot talk over each mm -hmm. other because you will not get clean audio. It will sound bad. So taking that to the table has been really helpful, even when I'm playing in like a con game or something like that, being really conscious of when other people are talking or just watching sort of their body language. Like you can tell when somebody wants to say something. You mm -hmm. can see it on their face or they're kind of leaning forward or something like that. And letting people have those moments to say what they want to say rather than listening to what people have to say rather than waiting for your turn to talk, which is, you know, just a general communication technique. But I think it's a thing that we have to think really hard about in podcasting. And I think a thing that would translate really well to a home table too. And maybe some systems might be helpful in that regard. I am an infrastructure nerd. So if there is a way to make a rule or a system that makes it easier, maybe, you know, you don't have fluency in in reading social cues the way others may. Maybe you're, you know, neurodiverse and you need some accommodation in in the ways that you communicate with people around you. So if it's as simple as like putting up a finger when you want to add something, we I do that really frequently on mic in our game so that the other person knows that at the early kind of possible convenience, they will pause and kind of gesture and, and let me go. So that is, you know, whether you need a card, a button, a light, a gesture, something that makes it easier for you. You know, if, if it's a thing where you consistently might feel talked over or like people are passing you by or, you know, you need some help advocating for a thing you want to do. I hope that everyone feels comfortable kind of saying to their party, you know, maybe before or after their session, maybe at a different time over group chat, if that's easier or more comfortable to say, you know, listen, I, I feel this way. I know no one's doing it intentionally, but if anyone has ideas on how to help out, you know, let's let's try them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being talked over gets really frustrating and can really kind of ruin an experience for other people. Yeah. So I always encourage people to be to speak up for themselves when people are talking over you, because as a lady gamer, that is a thing that has happened to me lots of times, and it's a bummer. <laughs> On the other hand, just be mindful that you're not doing that to other people, too, because it feels bad. But I, I, I like your point, too, about even having some kind of signal, too, because you're right. Some people are not always the most fluent in, in body language. And I think, too, especially when you play online, you know, we have video right now, but we I know with my group for a while, we didn't. And adding that made a huge difference. But if you are in that same position of not being super great at reading people, it can be really difficult. And so, you know, having even like a chat open where you can just, you know, push a button or something like that. There's lots of options, but just trying to make sure that you're giving everybody a turn to mm -hmm. do their thing and to participate and be active and have those moments where they get to be enthusiastic too. Yeah. And let them do their own thing, too. And don't try to play their character for them, you know? L let them be how they want to be with their character and pay attention and be there to support them if they need it. Yeah, I think character autonomy is yeah. huge. And it's something that it's incredibly important to me. And I think you'll notice probably in a lot of actual plays too, people have put a lot of investment into their characters. And I generally think those are conversations a lot of us have out of game talking about like ownership of your character. Don't dictate what someone else's character is doing. 
don't just don't that's there i have very few hard rules of how to play a game but don't do that (laughs) i didn't realize until y'all mentioned that how like anathema to me it feels to tell another person what their character does or says I- i've just realized that, like in the last you know year and a half of, of making join the party i've never once said johnny does this tracy thinks this you know and and telling my my colleagues what their characters do it's like do you guys know the golden compass series by philip pullman yes. i'm getting some nods good it's it's like touching someone else's daemon like it is just completely not okay in my mind maybe that's not <laughs> true of all groups but i think starting from a place of i'm responsible for me and my character and it also helps i think with character relationship building if in character you ask someone else a question or you say i'm gonna do this is that cool with you guys not everyone may be as communicative mm-hmm. but in general you know asking questions whether it's in or out of character is uh at least for me way more comfortable it makes me feel like i'm not just being swept along in the action but that i am an active participant even if that's running after a character that's already run out of the room (laughs) yeah it's an issue of consent and yeah i think in character or out of character i wouldn't want someone to do that to me in real life and granted there are lots of things you do in games that you wouldn't do in real life but someone dictating to me what i am or am not allowed to do is not Mm -hmm. acceptable and so I need to be able to have control over that and have that kind of autonomy over my character and my decisions. That's like not negotiable. <laughs> <laughs> we do a lot of suggesting at the mm-hmm. table. Um, and I think that mm-hmm. comes from like us just knowing each other for so long and kind of knowing the arcs of our characters a bit more because the boys in particular have been playing the dwarves for three years so they've Mm -hmm. been with these characters for a long time and so like i can say something like oh well maybe erock does this you know maybe erock would be interested in doing something like this totally Mm -hmm. and i also do it a lot in our sunday group because we have some newer players who are fresh to their characters and so like trying to kind of like give them a little bit of a a role to kind of like, oh yeah, that's, that's great. A prompt. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's a great idea. Let me roll with that and put my own little spin on it kind of deal. And I think that stuff can be really helpful because you you kind of develop characters in tandem with other characters. Um, So that kind of suggesting from other players can be helpful in terms of building characters that mesh well together. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to like dictating and just like speaking for other people's characters, that's just rude. Like, yeah. just don't. It's definitely okay to speak strategy, especially if you're, you know, talking to another character in character. Having those sort of discussions is perfectly fine, but phrasing it of, okay, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, I'll do this, and then we'll be ready to beat this guy and get on to the next part of the story. That that's just a type of player experience that you don't want to be on the receiving end of. So don't be on the passing end of it. People should always have the option to say no. And I think role-playing is a collaborative experience. And so giving those kinds of suggestions or saying, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if this kind of thing, but the person should always have the option to say no. And so that's kind of where it, where that line is for me, is if I feel like you are saying, you do this thing, there's no question there. And so it should be phrased as a question or a suggestion or something like that. And I should have the opportunity to say, no, thank you. I don't mm-hmm. like that. And that's what the next card is good for, too. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> do you think that players in podcasts make character decisions differently than people at the table? I think some players in some actual play podcasts make different character decisions. I know that there are other actual play podcasts where the characters and the players have more direct say in what's actually happening in like the big plot and maybe even subplots. That's not how we work. We're pretty in the dark about everything that goes on behind the screen. We're pretty classic in that way. Mm. Um, And the boys in particular barely even know they're on a podcast. So, um, <laughs> be, pure um method. they just, um, they're both dads. They both have kids who are under 10. 
So they're both very busy and they support what we're doing with the podcast. And they, of course, enjoy being on the podcast in terms of coming to the game and and playing their characters. But I try very hard to uh, make sure that they don't have any extra burden of like podcasting. So when they show up to the table, they're showing up 100% as players. They are not showing up as podcasters. So all of their decision making is I'd be surprised if they made any decisions differently because we podcast now. I do because I'm, you know, in love with the person who's running the game and invested in the podcast. So I probably put a little bit more thought into like, if Aspen does this, where will the story go? But um, I don't think the boys do. What about you, Amanda? Do you think you approach it differently between home games versus podcasting? Uh, Well, I I grew up, of course, making uh, decisions only on a podcast. So it's a really interesting kind of inversion of what I understand most podcasters experiences to be. But I think we have a really good mix of being able to, like when we're recording, I at this point have kind of developed habits of of not over talking, of doing and not describing what I'm doing, things that sound good for tape. Before we started the show, we had a whiteboard that we'd wheel into the studio every time we recorded with the rules that we came up with for our sessions. So, you know, we had a, like a whole kind of tenant of bad D&D podcasts and we wanted not to be male centric, not to be nerd centric, not to be too joke centric. We wanted to make the story come first. We had to add a rule not to make too many McElroy references because all of us are big fans <laughs> of the Adventure Zone uh, and said the word goof a lot. So, you know, there were these kind of guidance points that I've since sort of internalized. But in in general, I only have to think about doing what my character would do. And I'm able to, you know, kind of trust our, our DM to steer the story where it has to be. That being said, during and after every uh, story arc, he, Eric, our DM, asks us what we want to do, what we want to accomplish, if we want to do anything in between kind of finishing one chapter and starting the next. So I have this opportunity to give input, but it is really kind of nice for me only to have to think about being true to my character, making choices that are right for her, and kind of like stewing in the like wonderful simmering soup of the game uh, and not thinking too much about the rest of the meal, if you want to extend a metaphor. So for me, now that I'm doing actual play stuff, I have a tendency to kind of make a decision based on what I think is going to tell the most interesting story, as opposed to what I think is best for my character. Because sometimes, not so much that like, I think it's a decision my character wouldn't make, but it's not going to end well for them, whether they would or would not make that decision. I try to keep it in character, like this is something that person would do, but Amelia the player knows that that is not going to go well for Adelaide the character. I like to make those decisions based on what I think is going to be most interesting rather than what is best for my character. Do you guys find that you do that occasionally? I mean, I do, but I think that comes from my starting point of wanting to make a really interesting character. All of my characters, I try very hard to like make them someone who is somebody who would go out and do things and go out and mm-hmm. make interesting decisions. So I kind of always think in the, what would make the most interesting story. I think whether it, it works out good or bad for your character is going to depend on the character and the kind of story that you're telling. If you're playing a Blades in the Dark story, the most interesting story is probably going to be the one where it's not going to go great for your character. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas if you're playing a more like rompful D&D campaign, kind of the way we do, we've been described as easy listening D&D. Um, so I... The smooth jazz of D&D. <laughs> right. That's... Easy listening is hard uh, making. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's definitely work. But yeah, I think just, you know, making an interesting character will lead you to making interesting choices. And I I guess I definitely select for decisions that are more cooperative. Like I play a rogue assassin. She should not be (laughs) opting in to any missions that involve any other people. But I realized very early on that, you know, I kind of put myself in a bind by choosing that character. They should not have let me choose that character (laughs) because we have to be a party. So finding a, a real believable I guess, motivation for that decision was was important. And having like a real basis grounded in like our play and our characters relationships that would motivate my character to stick around and to, you know, buy into the larger mission was really, really crucial. So that's, that's kind of how we do it here. But I imagine that'll be really helpful for everyone. That being said, I love playing One Quiet Year. 
because that is a game that at its outset tells you that everyone's going to die at the end. And (laughs) as someone who is so intensely like risk averse, it was a really emotional and important exercise for me to play a game where, you know, I, I knew that the end game couldn't be preserving my own life. It had to be making an interesting story. So I'm sure I can unpack in therapy why that was the case, <laughs> but it was a useful <laughs> exercise for me as a player as well to kind of think about not just my own fate, but about the the journey and the campaign as a whole. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, though, that because role playing is collaborative and most of the time you are assumed to be traveling or doing whatever with this group of people, your decisions need to be sort of rooted in the idea that you are together doing this thing. Even if your characters don't necessarily get along with each other or that's like a tense relationship, you cannot be the loner in the corner Mm -hmm. like of the tavern who doesn't talk to anybody. That is not a fun game to play and nobody would listen to that Mm -hmm. on a podcast. Here goes the rogue doing another (laughs) five hour mission by themselves. I guess we'll go play video games. (laughs) <laughs> right <laughs> yeah that's that does not make for a good no, podcast no. and um doesn't make for a great experience for other people around the no. table watching you have your dark brooding yeah, moment but, and you can have those experiences on a podcast pretty easily but don't record it with all of the other players sitting around doing nothing yes we are a that's huge fan mm-hmm. of splitting the party on our show And it's not every episode, it's maybe like once or twice per story arc, which is generally like between seven and 10 episodes. But there are there are sections of the show where sometimes we'll go off and have a, you know, 10, 15 minute moment on our own with other players sitting there. Other times we go to the living room and have a break while the DM and a player record something that we then hear on the show, which Mm -hmm. is a very cool experience to like be surprised by your own uh, podcast story. But like our, our DM Eric has written and spoken really eloquently about justifications for splitting the party ways to do it correctly ways to make it enhance the story and collaboration in a way that you know i guess is not uh, obvious but you don't have to like stay together all the time for the sake of togetherness you need to mm-hmm. think about what serves everybody best talk about it talk about it talk about it outside the game and figure out the best and most entertaining way to proceed yeah and if you want to do that sort of stuff at home that that's perfectly fine uh, you and your dm could get together on an off day and yeah. run through a, a little mini solo adventure where you go and do your your little rogue assassinating by yourself and then come back to the table. Your character has had that experience. Nobody else is supposed to know about it. Now you've got this little bit of a secret that they can potentially find out about, which makes for a really interesting story and character interaction, I believe. Yeah, I definitely think it goes both ways there. The, you can't you can't be the one who is always like insisting on being mm-hmm. by themselves and not working with everybody, but on the other hand, don't drag people along if they're not going to be like important to that scene that you're mm-hmm. having. If you're going to go on a mission and everything, there's no reason that, you know, your smooth talker face type character needs to be the one to break into the museum. Mm-hmm. That's just silly. So, it, that kind of leaves that person feeling like they don't really have anything to do or like they're not necessary to that scene. And so it's it's definitely okay to split people up that way if it's going to enhance the story and make for a more more reasonable narrative, I guess. And it depends on the size of your party too. Yes. For our pod- <laughs> definitely. <laughs> we're only a three person party for our podcast. So mm-hmm. we tend to not split as much as some others would because that necessitates that somebody's going to be by themselves. And none of us are really that optimized for being solo. But I think part of the, I guess, the the rogue problem, air quotes, is part of why... uh, I want a t-shirt with that. (laughs) I I think that's why the uh, Blades in the Dark is so popular right now and is getting so much steam, is because there are all these people that would love, 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 love to play a rogue, but they're stuck in these parties where they have to be super cooperative. Mm -hmm. And so rogues don't really get to shine. But if the entire party is a party of rogues, well, then, you know, you can all go off and have a fun time. That sounds like a podcast in and of itself. It is. It's called Magpies. (laughs) Oh, yes. I was going to say, isn't that what Magpies (laughs) is? (laughs) Yeah. Also on the list of things that we're going to cover at some point. Yeah, yeah. I think... We brought up a good point, though, about having out-of-character discussions about those kinds of scenes that you want to have. That is one thing that I've found really helpful, 
is, you know, ahead of time or in game to say, hey, I really want to express this thing as my character or I want to have this kind of scene and saying that either to the GM or to the other players that you you would like to do something there. And it doesn't have to be a big secret all the time. I I have weird, complicated feelings about in-character versus out-of-character player secrets, <laughs> yeah. which we don't have time for. But having that kind of communication with people and saying, hey, I want to talk through this thing, you as a player can know that that's coming up, but your character doesn't have mm-hmm. to. Having those kind of out-of-game discussions can be really helpful. And you almost have to have the, the right GM as well to to go along with that sort of meta talk at the table. Because I can see some GMs would kind of crack down on that and say, you know, it, we don't want other players to know what they're not supposed to know, you know. So let's let it be a surprise. But if you work with your players and if your players work with your GM, you can enhance the story in ways that you probably never imagined before by suggesting certain things. And maybe your suggestion is just a little seed and somebody else at the table is like, oh, well, what about this? And then somebody else is like, oh, and then if you do this on top of that? And then it turns into something just mind-blowing, yeah. And you wouldn't get that if you didn't have that sort of meta talk from time to time at the table. And that's perfectly fine. Something we did early on at our DM's request was each of us as players met with one another one-on-one and then with the DM to talk about what our character's motivations are and what we want, what we're excited about, what we absolutely would not do, just to get a little more kind of flavor and insight on each other. And in my case, you know, my first time making a character like this, I had to like think of those answers that wasn't obvious to me, that wasn't in my brain. So in conversation, you know, with my with my friends and, and my colleagues, that sort of came out. So that was really, really useful to me. And as I've mentioned, we always have the opportunity to tell our DM if we want to do something, if we don't want to do something, and he'll find a way to put that into the action. But listen, it's not it's not simple, you know, maintaining this kind of relationship and, and doing this kind of hobby. There have been moments where people's feelings have been really hurt and where we have felt disappointed or alienated or, you know, leave a session feeling bad. And it has taken, you know, over a year and a half, like a couple of deep conversations for for us to feel super comfortable with one another. And it's got, you know, it, it sort of is not natural for me to to feel super comfortable in all my feelings. My personal instinct is to be like, oh, no, it's silly of me to feel badly about this or to feel jealous or to feel slighted. But the fact is the only the only silly option is to ignore it and not talk about it. So being able to say to my fellow players, listen, I'm sorry, but it makes me feel a little bit slighted when you do this. Or listen, I feel kind of icky about whatever either privately or at the table after we play, it went a huge way toward making us so much more comfortable than I thought we could be in the long term. Playing with your role-playing group is another form of a relationship. These are your friends or, I mean, even if they're not your friends, your play group is a form of a relationship. And I think when we're doing AP podcasting, we have this sort of added level of necessity to getting along with each other because it can't sound like we aren't friends. And so you cannot have those kinds of beefs with people because you need to sound like you are cooperative and getting along. But it forces us to have those kinds of conversations either, you know, in the middle of a game, after a game, we are really big on doing like a session zero and character creation all together to say, here's what I want out of this. Here's things that definitely are no's for me. Yeah. But people really should be doing that in their home games, too. That communication is really key because this is a kind of relationship. You are being vulnerable with people. Even if your character is not you, you are expressing those kinds of emotions and there is a sense of vulnerability in that. Uh, So are there any concepts that you personally have brought from playing on the mic to your home games? I know, Amanda, you kind of did this, right? You started out on the mic and then went to your home games. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't 
have any home games before I had a podcast one. So just the desire to complement my on mic experience with other ones, recreational experiences, you know, podcasting is fun, but it's also work. And so it's been really important to me to kind of develop a relationship with gaming outside of the job that isn't in public, a place where I can mess up and ask dumb questions and try different characters and just kind of exercise different parts of my like gaming brain and my character playing brain. So I mentioned a couple of, you know, game systems that we've done, you know, whether it's A Quiet Year or Monster Hearts or Betrayal at House on the Hill, Catan, you know, Jenga, like even (laughs) even just sort of what I would think of as like silly games or, you know, games that I play on my phone help me, a non-gamer, feel like I am getting like a balanced diet and that gaming is not just (laughs) associated with work because I know it's a bit of an atypical experience, but that's that's really gone a long way to um, making me feel excited for every recording session and not just like a humdrum, here we are, you know, let's do it one more time because that would uh, that would not be fun to listen to and it wouldn't be fun to play. What about you, Grayson? Have you discovered things about how you changed how you play at home after doing podcasting? I don't really think that I've changed anything in particular because like I said, by like we record one mic on the table, so it's pretty much like as close as you could get to a home game in a podcast as you can get. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think for me what I, I I think what I bring to my home games is that level of enthusiasm that I have to build up for the podcast. I can also siphon that over to the rest of my games. Um, And especially right now, because I'm actually running my Sunday night game, which is my first DM experience. Oh, cool. So it's been been interesting trying to, like, manage my expectations on how's that going to go, because the only DM I've ever had is my partner, who runs the podcast and has been gaming for decades. (laughs) So I'm really spoiled. (laughs) and um, have really high expectations of myself. And so I think for me, what I, what I actually bring to my home game is knowing that my AP is so similar to my home game. Like knowing the actual reality of it, I can manage my expectations a little better because I know how much gets cut out of the podcast and left into the, our, uh, our full-length cuts that we put on our Patreon. Yeah, that is nice to know. Having come from listening to a lot of APs and then going to play a game at the table and being like, this is not what it sounds like when they do it. This is not the experience that they're having. And now being on the other end of the microphone, I'm like, oh, no, we're all having the same experience here. There's all kinds of dumb goofs and like mistakes in the background and people getting up and leaving to do things and, you know, cats. all of those kinds of things. You just, yes, cats, <laughs> so many cats. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, no, they're, we're all having the same experience that you're having. It's OK. <laughs> and just like not being disappointed mm-hmm. by that. It's fine. Anything else that you guys want to add that we didn't cover yet? I was just going to say fill in the gaps because there's a there's a lot of stuff that's cut in AP podcasts that will happen at your normal tables as well. So just understand that you're not going to be perfect for an hour straight every single time you sit down at the table. Totally. Strongly agree. Any other last words from you guys? I think if you were to take away one thing from this... I would hope it would be to bring your enthusiasm to the table and to look for actual plays, not as like a goal of what you want your role playing experience to be, but as inspiration for what it could be. Completely co-signed. All of our party listened to the same APs before we started one of our own. We wanted to listen really widely to figure out what was out there and what we wanted to do in our own little corner. And that was a really useful exercise for us to have a kind of example to hold up and say, I love this about podcast A. I love this about podcast B. I love this element of this character in podcast C and really have a little like group homework assignment where when we talked about what our campaign would be like, and then of course what the podcast would be like, you know, we had some, some real like intentionality behind it. And we weren't just kind of showing up to, you know, the game without any preparation to just start, which I'm sure is fun, but for, for me, it would have been a little nerve wracking. So, you know, 
using this, if this is a space you love, and if you're listening, it probably is, as a way to kind of triangulate toward your ideal playing experience would be great. And, you know, like me, it's important for me to have a balanced diet of groups of games of sessions that are one off versus two or three sessions versus a long campaign. It's it's hard for one group, one campaign, one character, one story to be everything that you need. So I would definitely encourage you, even if you are a diehard, you know, devotee to one game system, um, <laughs> to try a little bit of, you know, exercises, a little bit dessert, whatever you want to, you know, metaphor is useful for you to, to try some other stuff, maybe with some other friends as well. Thank you both so much for sitting down with us. We really appreciate it. Amanda, can you remind everyone where they can find you online and about your projects? Yes, thank you so much for having me. Join the Party is a beginner-friendly, accessible with transcripts and mono audio and other ways that people who are deaf and hard of hearing may be able to participate in this wonderful world of AP podcasts and queer as hell. So if you are interested in any of those or a great story that sounds really beautiful, you can find us at jointhepartypod.com or join the party in any podcast app, Spotify, wherever you may be. And we are under the banner of Multitude, which is a podcast collective of enthusiastic great and you know critical podcasts about things that we love so you can search multitude in your podcast app or go to multitude.productions thank you for having me and grayson do you want to tell people where they can find you and what your projects are sure you can find heroes not included which is also queer as hell on pretty much any podcast app you can get your hands on we also have a patreon where we release our patron cast where we go through uh, different types of systems as well as releasing our unedited podcast which contains all that meta talk all the longer goofs so people who are into that can get their fix you can also find us on twitter and through twitter you can also find me and through me on twitter you can also find the trans language primer if you're looking for a great resource on uh, trans and gender experience yeah and we'll go ahead and put notes in the in the show notes uh, so we can funnel people to you very easily Yes, people need more queer as hell podcasts. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you both so much again. And thank you, everybody out there for listening. Character Evolution Cast, like Character Creation Cast, is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter, at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter, at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter, at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for today's guest can also be found in the show notes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you will find other great shows like Campaign. Campaign is an Edge of the Empire actual play show that's nominally about Star Wars, but actually just three men and a baby in space. Join host Cat Cool as she attempts to tell a coherent Star Wars story around some Chicago improvisers.